Okay, salam alaikum, everyone. I think we'll uh, make a start. Um, just a, a reminder that the last time uh, we met, um, we were looking at the, uh, you know, what is the, the Western tradition and why should we care about it, basically. We looked at Hellenism, Alexander the Great, his conquering of vast areas of the Middle East right up to India, the spread of Greek civilization, culture, language, ideas, <coughs> concepts. We looked at Plato, Aristotle, perhaps the two of three, with Socrates, the three great philosophers of the ancient world and their enduring influence in today's world. We briefly touched on Judaism. Um, but today I, I want to go much more into um, faith, uh, particularly Christianity and Judaism and the early church up to Constantine, the Emperor Constantine uh, in the fourth century. <clears throat> um, but before I touch on that, um, Western politicians, uh, particularly in America for some reason, but happens in Britain as well, like to talk about the Judeo-Christian tradition. It's this great spiritual, philosophical, uh, intellectual tradition that we're very proud of in the West, the Judeo-Christian tradition. And as I say, it's often mentioned by politicians in defending Western values, very important we defend Western values against, I'm not sure who, who against, but anyway, that's the idea. Now, it's pretty obvious, isn't it, that this excludes Islam and Muslims, even though Islam has been a crucial part of the West for over a thousand years. Um, now, we all know about Islamic Spain, Andalusia, which I think was nearly eight centuries. And it was the most advanced place in the entire European area in terms of culture, science, learning, um, in, in every way conceivable, it was the most advanced civilization in the heart of Europe, in the, in the Iberian Peninsula, what we today call Spain and Portugal. And indeed, there, there, there was a, sort of white Muslim countries like Bosnia, of course, which has a slight majority of uh, European Muslims and other parts of Europe, which have been Muslims, Muslim for hundreds and hundreds of years. So Islam has been part of the European identity, history, civilization, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and excellence in terms of learning for centuries. But you wouldn't know that by this kind of trope, Judeo-Christian. So it should really be the Judeo-Islamic Christian tradition. That would be more accurate, more fair. Now, why am I showing you this coin? Does anyone recognize this coin, by the way? Does anyone know what it is? It's uh, King of Mercy of Hathorex. Exactly, exactly. In fact, um, I think Adnan Rashid, who's a friend of mine, would love this. I think he'd love to own this coin, <laughs> but it's unique. Um, that's the front and the back. So you can just about work out in Latin, I think. Offer, Rex. Rex is Latin for king. Offer is the name of the king. And on the back is some Arabic, which is not very easy to read because it's not a, a terribly accurate copy. It's kind of like a mirror image rather than an accurate copy. So wh why is this coin so important? Well, as, as the brother has already said, um, this, was, this coin was made for Offa, who was the king of Mercia, and he reigned from 757 to 796 AD. Okay, so it's just shortly after, well there's a harbour actually, and the design is uh, copied directly from a dinar coin um, of Offa's contemporary, the Abbasid Caliph Al-Mansur, and he reigned, uh, he was the Caliph uh, 136 to 158 after, after Hijra, after the Hijra. And uh, it's supposed to say, that's supposed to be the Shahada on the right, and it's in the British Library uh, in England, in London, and I, I've seen it, it's on display usually, and it's gold. So here we have a, a King of England, if you like, who is issuing currency, coinage, with the Shahada on it in the 8th century AD. Okay, so what's Islam got to do with Europe? Well, the English king was issuing coins <laughs> in Arabic, and that's his name offer there. And there's a wonderful um, comment on the website of the British Library, which I recommend you have a look. It says, the choice of an Islamic dinar as a model for offers gold coinage should not be interpreted as an indication of offers religious beliefs, as other evidence leaves no doubt that he was a Christian, which is true. The coin probably reflects instead the importance of the gold dinar in international trade. 
It was the dominant coinage in the Mediterranean and inspired the reintroduction of gold coinage in Northern Europe. So you get the real sense of the power, the commercial political power of the Muslim world very early on to such an extent that England produced coins with the Shahada on in Arabic. <laughs> okay. And this, this is the real thing. There's a wonderful website uh, dedicated uh, to this on the British Library. You can Google it, lots of information about it. I wish this was better known uh, because this is a literally gold dust. It's a gold coin. So th that's just to perhaps knock on the idea, knock on the, he the head on the idea that the Judeo-Christian tradition excludes Islam. In fact, Europe, the West, is very much uh, part of Islamic history as well. I mentioned Islamic Spain. Now, I want to briefly touch, just change the subject now, and go back to Judaism, because um, this is a really important subject. Here is a rabbi, obviously not a photograph. <laughs> now, what's he doing? He is studying the Talmud. Now, Christians will often say, Jews follow the Old Testament. Yeah, they follow the Old Testament. Christians follow the New Testament. Muslims follow the Quran. That's actually not true. No Jew says they follow the Old Testament. What they, their central text, the central text of rabbinic Judaism, which I'll define in a second, is the Talmud. What's the Talmud? Well, it comes in two forms. It's a very, very ancient library of texts. And it's made up of several parts. Um, so we have the, uh, the Torah, which is, I'm, I'm speaking now, I'm trying to understand the Jewish perspective on this. This is the Torah given to Moses on Mount Sinai, of course, usually identified with the first five books of the Old Testament, starting with Genesis, in the beginning. Now, there's a second part of um, the, the Talmud called the Mishnah, the Mishnah. Now, the Mishnah is the oral Torah. Hang on, Jews believe in two Torahs? Yes. Don't believe me? Google it. <laughs> they do. They believe in a written Torah and an oral Torah. It's a bit like the Quran and the Sunnah, if you want to kind of see a parallel with Islam, if you like. So they believe that God revealed an oral, a verbal Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai, in addition to the written Torah. Why, why would God do that, according to... Well, because it's to give extra detail, extra instructions. For example, it says you don't work on the Sabbath. It's the holy day. But what is that? What is work? Can I cook? Can I, uh, you know, can I flick a light switch? Can I, well, what does it mean not to work? And the oral Torah gives you all those details about what that really means. So you, actually you can't cook uh, on this. You're not supposed to do labor of any kind. Orthodox Jews follow this quite, quite strictly. So the oral Torah gives interpretation, further directives, detail, how to implement the commandments of God we find in the written Torah. Again, Quran and Sunnah. So we have Quran, uh, statements in the Quran, but we need the Sunnah to perhaps give further detail and implementation. It's like, well, the Quran says pray, but how do we pray? What do we pray? How many rakals and so on? Well, the Sunnah will give you that. In a similar kind of way, by analogy, we have the, uh, the, the Talmud. So we've got the written Torah, the oral Torah called the Mishnah, and then we have another thing, which is part of the Talmud. And this is the central text of Judaism, by the way. If you're a devout Jew today, you don't study the Old Testament, you study the Talmud, and that's what that rabbi is doing. Um, and there's a wonderful app, actually, where millions of Jews around the world follow a portion of the Talmud every day, and you can follow, follow them in doing it. So another part of the Talmud is something called the Gemara. And the Gemara are the, the rabbis, the sages as they're called, their discussions, arguments, disputes um, about all sorts of things, whether it be history, philosophy, the weather, you know, anything. Uh, and and, this is, and these discussions are actually recorded and now part of the Talmud. And this kind of went on till about the 5th or 6th century AD, um, before the rise of, of Islam. Um, and then it kind of stopped, uh, and then it kind of codified in many, many volumes. So you've got the, the written, the oral Torah, and the, uh, the Gemara, which is kind of the rabbinical commentaries, discussions. Um, and just to make it slightly more complicated, there are actually two Talmuds. There's the Babylonian Talmud, which is the main one used today by Jews around the world. And there's also the Palestinian, or the, the Jerusalem um, Talmud, which is earlier and shorter. But the one that the vast majority of Jews use today is the um, Babylonian. Of course, well, why are Jews in Babylon? Well, we know from the exile. It's all there in the Old Testament. They got exiled in I Iraq or Mesopotamia. 
whatever you want to call it. So the Talmud is absolutely central to the Jewish faith. What is rabbinic Judaism? Well, we'll perhaps we'll come back to that because Judaism is not just one thing that's always been just the same since the beginning. It has actually changed uh, fundamentally. And the, the, the key historical event to mark that change is the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70. And that changed everything. Uh, and then, in fact, in the second century, because of the ongoing threat, the existential threat to the Jewish people from the Romans, it was decided to write down the oral Torah as the Mishnah. So now we have two written Torahs, but it's still called the oral Torah. Um, because there was a real threat that, uh, um, I mean, it's like with the, the early Sahaba, someone who were killed in battle, you know, who, who memorized the Quran. We need to perhaps, there's a similar kind of dynamic at work, I think. So that, that, that's um, very, very briefly is uh, Judaism. And it's not quite the same as the religion of Jesus or the religion of Moses, peace be upon them both. And I'll explain why um, as we go forward. So, let's have a look. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to talk about um, a man called Jesus. Now, who was Jesus? What did he look like? Well, we all know in the West he was a white guy. He was a Caucasian. Of course he was. There's a photograph. And he's actually a famous Hollywood actor. He's a white dude. How do we know that? Because you can see the movies. You can see the art in churches. You can see the statues. Well, not that you'd want to see statues, but there are lots of statues of Jesus in your local Catholic church of a white guy with a beard, pretty fairly handsome, probably in his mid-30s. And his mother, of course, is white as well. And she always wears a hijab, by the way, I find, which is interesting. So she's a hijabi, white Caucasian woman in Western consciousness, Western art. Um, why is that wrong, by the way? Because the West tells us that Jesus was white. Well, why, why is that a problem, out of interest? Because he came from Okay, so he was from the Middle East, you say? Yeah. Gosh, okay. So he wasn't from England, okay. <laughs> I noticed that every country yeah. in the world they represent Jesus how they look. This is very true. Sometimes they yes. represent them as being black. This is actually a very good point, perhaps in mitigation for the, the guilt that the West have for misrepresenting Jesus. If you look at uh, Japanese and Chinese iconography, which you can just Google it, you'll see a Japanese Jesus or a Chinese Jesus. If you look in Sub-Saharan African, you'll see a black, a Somali Jesus. You'll see whatever. So actually everyone does it. But because of the, the dominance of the West in defining faith and images of, of religious leaders, we tend to go with, with that. Um, so that, that's the first point. He, he wasn't white. He, he was a Jew. He was an Israelite. Um, I'm not sure what he would have looked like. We don't know. We have no photographs, of course. But he certainly would have looked like me. He would have looked. <laughs> um, he might. He would have appeared more, perhaps, of an Arab, like an Arab, perhaps. Um, now, all this changed, by the way, in popular consciousness, particularly in biblical scholarship, with the writing of a book, this one, by a guy called Giza Vermesh. That's how you pronounce it. And he wrote a book in 1973 called Jesus the Jew. Jesus was a Jew? Yes, actually. He was a Jew. And this, I forget this guy's name. He's um, in one of the Hollywood films portraying Jesus. I can't remember his name. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's not important. Um, <clears throat> so this guy, Giza Vermish, by the way, very, very interesting. He, he, was, uh, he died just a couple of years ago. He was a Hungarian Jew by birth, by ethnicity. And in the 1930s, because he, he, he was a young man in the 1930s, he uh, was baptized as a, as a Catholic, Roman Catholic, but he became a Catholic priest. And he'd hoped that this would save him from the Holocaust, because obviously that was a, obviously an extremely important threat at that time. So he left, um, it didn't, and he left Hungary and ended up in England, of all places, and um, he ended up being um, a professor of Jewish studies at the University of Oxford. And in his generation, he was probably the most distinguished Jesus scholar in the world. And he's actually more famous for being the world's expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls. So if you, if you get the, the standard critical edition of the Dead Sea Scrolls, published by Oxford University Press, he's the guy that edited it, translated it from the original languages, uh, into English. So he's the foremost expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls, but he's actually a brilliant 
Jesus Scholar, as it's called as well. And in 1973, he published this book, which I've read. And what was really revolutionary for many people was the idea that Jesus wasn't a Gentile. He, didn't, he, well, he wasn't a Westerner. He was a Jew. But not just a label, he was a Jew. Jesus was a Torah-observant Jew. You could understand Jesus in his historical context using the earliest evidence we have, written evidence and other evidence. You have an understanding. He developed an understanding of Jesus that's actually quite different from the Christian understanding. In fact, that's an understatement. For Giza Vermish, Jesus, the real, the historical Jesus, was a, a, a Jewish wise man. He was a, a prophet, an eschatological prophet, perhaps, um, who certainly didn't preach that he was God or the Trinity or the Church. These were later ideas, he argued. <coughs> Um, and he has actually written a number of books. I do recommend them all. They're quite brilliant and they're highly regarded by, by biblical, uh, biblical scholars. Um, now, I just want to introduce you to the, uh, the four Gospels. Why is this important? Well, why, are we, why am I even talking about the Gospels? We're in Turkey. We're talking about the Western tradition. Well, I would say that the Bible is the single most important and significant book in the history of Western civilization, bar none. It's the most important. And within that, the Gospels are the most important texts within the Bible, bar none. So whether or not you're a devout Christian who re reads these for inspiration and guidance, or you're a historian trying to understand the nature of the texts, what they're really saying, or you're just curious, these are the, uh, the most important, I think, over the last 2,000 years, texts of all, deforming the Western mind and particularly perceptions of other religions like Islam as well. So, you know, they're important and they're worth knowing about. So there are four Gospels. Uh, what are Gospels? These are basically, well, I'm now gonna give you very, very briefly the standard Christian view of what these Gospels are and what they say and why they're important. And then I'll tell you what scholars have been saying for the last two centuries. And they're not the same, there's quite a big difference. So there are, I'm, I'm now going to um, act like a Christian. So I'm going to tell you what the, the Gospels are from a Christian point of view. It's not my opinion, but I'm just going to play this role for a second. So the four Gospels, obviously they're the word of God. They are eyewitness accounts of the life and times of Jesus written by eyewitnesses. So Matthew, the first Gospel, was written by the tax collector, Matthew, who knew Jesus. The last Gospel, John, is written by the Apostle John, who knew Jesus so well. And Luke was a companion of Paul. Uh, Paul was a, another apostle. And Mark was perhaps uh, closely associated with Peter, the prince of the apostles. So the, these, these gospels give us reliable, accurate, historical information. There are not really any contradictions about who Jesus was. And Jesus was God, and he died for our sins on the cross. Um, that's been very simplistically put. Now, I'm going to take off my Christian hat and <laughs> come back to what scholars are saying. Sorry, Please. Yes, I should say, but I do ask questions. I'm not rambling on here. Carry on. Yes, Christian, yes, the sister's asking, the, the, the New Testament, the Gospels are seen as the word of God. Absolutely. I'll come to that. How can they, yes, I'll come to that in a second. How can they be eyewitness accounts? I'll come to that. So the, taking off the Christian hat and putting on what scholars would say, and by scholars, I mean academics at mainstream universities, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, you name it. You know, this is mainstream historical research that's been conducted for a couple of centuries now. So these are not my wacky ideas or some kind of marginal theory. I'm trying to give you the standard narrative. I'm not saying it's infallible, but I'm saying it's really worth looking at and, and, and being aware of. So uh, I'll just take a few random examples. The Gospels are eyewitness testimony. No, they're not. Scholars don't think that anymore. Matthew's Gospel, the first Gospel, is not written by Matthew. How do we know that? Well, firstly, the Gospel doesn't claim to be written by Matthew. It doesn't claim to be eyewitness testimony. And it doesn't read like a, um, a text produced by a disciple of Jesus, who would probably be illiterate, wouldn't be writing in Greek, because all the Gospels are written in Greek, not in the language of Jesus. Jesus spoke Aramaic, which is cognate to Arabic and Hebrew, actually. They're quite similar languages in many, many ways. I'm sure many of you know. The Gospels are not written in the language of Jesus. They're written in Greek. Remember we talked about Hellenization, Alexander the Great. This is another fruit of that. They're written in Greek. So they're not eyewitness. They're written in the second generation. They're not the first generation. The second generation after Jesus. 
And then um, in the handout, by the way, which you, I have copies if you want, I, I mentioned something called Markan priority. Again, this is what scholars say. Scholars have worked out that the first gospel to be written is a gospel of Mark. Mark and priority, that's what that jargon means. This is the view that Mark was the first of the Gospels to be written and was one of the sources used by Matthew and Luke. So the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first was written by Mark. And I want to introduce you to, um, we don't have much time, so I'm gonna rush through this, forgive me, but uh, I just want you to, I want to touch on some key ideas and you can, we can discuss them further. But, something called the Synoptic Gospels. On the handout, it, I mentioned it there. I'll just read what it says. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which narrate so many of the same stories that they can be placed side by side in parallel columns in the Greek, and so can be seen together. That's the literal meaning of synoptic. So you get the same stories um, in parallel Greek columns. So you have the story in, in Mark, then you have the, the similar story in Matthew, then you have the similar story in Luke. And you can compare the stories, how they're told, what happens, who says what, are there any differences? And scholars have concluded overwhelmingly that Matthew and Luke copy Mark, they gobble up Mark, they basically edit Mark, they take Mark and they change Mark in subtle or not so subtle ways to reflect their own views, their own theology, their own understanding of Jesus, their own understanding of the law, by which I mean the Jewish law, the Torah. And there are some surprising differences. So um, I want to give you an, an example of this um, at work. Um, there is a story in the earliest gospel, Mark chapter 10, which I'm just going to read to you and then explain to you how the later Gospels change the story and why this is so significant. So Mark chapter 10, verses uh, 17 onwards. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but um, it goes like this. I'm, looking, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, which is the standard academic translation into English. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before Jesus and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God alone. Remember, this is the earliest gospel. There's no one good. Why are you calling me good? Jesus says, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Don't, don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't defraud. Honor your father and mother. The man said to him, teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, excuse me, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. It's the one thing he lacks to get eternal life. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. So this is quite a startling passage for many people. And many scholars like Dale Martin at Yale, one of the world's leading biblical scholars who I've spoken to about this, you can see the video on, videos on blogging theology, consider this one of the most reliable and authentic statements from the historical Jesus. Why? Because it's so unlike later beliefs about Jesus. Here Jesus apparently is denying he's God. He's not saying, yeah, I'm good, thanks, I'm God. <laughs> you know, he's saying, why do you call me good? Jesus is being humble. He's being a devout Jew who says, look, goodness, real goodness belongs to God alone. Don't use that word of me. That's how I, I understand it. That's the first thing. And secondly, the man who comes to Jesus saying, good teacher, what do I do to inherit eternal life? You know, what do I do to be saved? How do I enter into paradise? How do I get into the Akira and be successful in the next life? Jesus gives them an answer. You obey the commandments. Huh? What's that got to do with Christianity? You know, don't steal, don't fraud, honour your father and mother. This is a quote from the Torah. And the man says, I've done all that. You know, it's not difficult not to kill people. It's not necessarily difficult not to steal. And so you can probably do that. Jesus says you lack one thing. This is the one thing he needs to get to eternal, eternal life. Go sell what you own and give your money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Wow. This is Christianity, is it? Is this Christianity? Is this what you'll hear from an evangelist in the pulpit? Now, that's the first thing. Matthew, as I say, quotes from Mark. He actually has this passage in front of him. This is the standard academic understanding. And he changes the words of Jesus. So I'm now going to go to Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 onwards. 
And we'll read the same story and see what happens. If I can find it. Um, what was it again? 1916. Let's get the right passage. Okay, 1916. So I'll just read what Matthew says and then I'll um, comment on it. Then someone came to him, this is Jesus, and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He means the Jewish commandments. Which ones? And Jesus said, don't murder, don't commit adultery. They're the same ones. Um, and then he says, if you wish to be perfect, because he lacks one thing again, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Now, attentive listeners and readers have long noticed that the words of Jesus here are different. In Mark, you have Jesus denying he is good. In Matthew, in Matthew's version, Jesus says, instead of saying, why do you call me good? Jesus says, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. Huh? What's going on there? So I remember I, I, I asked this question of J J John Barton, this professor of the Bible at Oxford, one of the world's most distinguished biblical scholars. He's an ordained Church of England minister as well. And he, he says that Matthew has been dishonest. His word, not mine. Why? Because he's changed the words of Jesus. Why has he changed the words of Jesus? Many scholars think that because Matthew was embarrassed that Jesus denied that he was God in Mark, so he changes the words of Jesus because it doesn't fit in with Matthew's views about who Jesus was later in the first century to better reflect what Matthew really thinks about Jesus. So he, he, he removes that embarrassment. He then has Jesus say, why do you ask me about what is good? Well, you're the Messiah. It's pretty, you should be able to ask you questions like that, but anyway. And then he has uh, Jesus say, if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments, which is a very Jewish answer. This is the Jewish, Jesus the Jew coming out here. Um, so I mentioned this example because, there, and there are many examples, which I'm not going to go into, of how later Gospels change, alter, embellish, delete, invent stories, sayings about Jesus to better reflect what they think in the later centuries, in the later decades of the first century. All this is standard scholarly stuff. If you're a Christian, you study this at university, which I did. It's, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. How can this be true? But this is the historical understanding of the Gospels. Now, I've not mentioned John yet. There's a four, the four Gospels. The last to be written was the Gospel of John. And they're all written in the first century, according to most scholars, between AD 70 and about AD 95. So Mark's are written about AD 70-ish, about the time of the destruction of the temple. And the last to be written is the Gospel of John. No, it's not an eyewitness account. It doesn't say who the author is, it doesn't name John. Christians will say, yes, it does. And I say, okay, show me where. And there's a usually several minutes of fumbling around in the Bible until they realize it's not actually mentioned by name. Remarkable, isn't it? <laughs> the, the, the titles, the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is found at the beginning, these, these titles or headings were added in the late second century. And we know this because someone called Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon in France, was the guy who first mentions this, long after they were written. They're anonymous. We don't know who wrote them. Anyway, back to John. John is the Cinderella. No, that's not the right word. John is the odd one out. Um, and this has been long noticed by scholars. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you have these are synoptic gospels. They actually are quite similar, and they feel Jesus' teaching is pretty much similar. You go to John, and you're in a different world. Here, in John, Jesus walks around saying, I am the light of the world, or before Abraham was, I am, or I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, I, I, am the, I am the light of the world. It's amazing statements. They're only found in one place. Nowhere else in the entire Bible are they found. They're only found in the Gospel of John. And the way Jesus speaks about his message, uh, his charisma, what, what he preaches, is very different in John than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And scholars have concluded, like 99% of scholars have concluded, and that's not my statistic, that comes from um, a book I recommend in the uh, recommended reading, by the way, by um, the historical figure of Jesus on the handout by E.P. Sanders, one of America's great biblical scholars. He says, 
99% of biblical scholars in the last two centuries have concluded that the historical Jesus, the real Jesus, is to be found in the earlier Gospels and that John represents a highly interpreted, developed account of what the author of the fourth Gospel believed about Jesus. And I'm reminded of some words of Richard Burridge, who's a professor at King's College in London, also an ordained minister. How do Christians deal with this problem? He's basically saying that they're secondary. Jesus didn't go around saying these things. And how, how do, um, why do they conclude this? If Jesus had gone around Galilee, downtown Jerusalem, in AD 30, saying, I am the light of the world, before Abraham was, I am, this is the divine name, the Tetragrammaton, found in Exodus 15. If he'd really done that, how come Matthew never mentions this? How come Luke, who says in the beginning of his gospel, uh, you know, dear Theophilus, I'm, I'm going to write to you an orderly account of everything that's happened amongst us. How come Luke knows n nothing about this teaching of Jesus? How come Matthew knows nothing about this teaching of Jesus? How, how come no one knows anything about this teaching of Jesus apart from the latest gospel written at the end of the first century? So 99% of scholars included this is not historical because if he had gone around making these incredible claims, then someone would have noticed it before the end of the first century obviously, but it's left no trace in the earlier Jesus tradition, in the historical evidence at all. So, I'm, I'm, to be crude, it's made up. Now, scholars, by the way, don't use words like that. They don't say, oh, it's made up, because that's too crude. What they say is, the jargon of the trade, they say it's secondary. It's secondary material. So you've got to kind of decode this language here, but they really mean is he didn't actually say it. And that's the view of the overwhelming vast majority of scholars in the world, and most scholars are Christians. They don't want to reach this conclusion, they're just being honest. Okay, so um, that's my very brief, uh, just to go back to the glossary by the way, which um, I've got extra copies if you want. Um, I've got, I mentioned Mark and Priority, I mentioned the Synoptic Gospels, and I mentioned the term um, Son of God. I'll just briefly touch on this because it's a bit of a it's an interesting issue. What does Son of God mean? You've asked many Christians, well, Son of God, God the Son. It means he's God, obviously. That's what the word means. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It meant that later on in Christian tradition, any human being, human or angels, with a close relationship with God and who mediates God's will on earth can be called a Son of God. And it's interesting, Adam is called the Son of God in the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 3, verse 38. Look it up. Luke calls Adam the son of God. Is Luke divine? Of course not. David's called the son of God. Lots of people are called sons of God in the Bible. And in Jesus, is reported to have said in Matthew, blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called sons of God. It didn't mean the second person of the Trinity. As, as I put in the handout here, it's anyone with a close relationship with God who mediates God's will on earth. So lots of people, it didn't mean that. In the Jewish context, Jesus the Jew, if he was addressed, uh, understood to be son of God, it did not mean he was the second person of the Trinity. I think that's a pretty well established historical fact. So um, moving on, so any questions? I'm covering, I, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of material here, I apologize. I'm just trying to condense it into this short time we have together, so I apologize, sorry. Uh, the Greek meaning of son, son The Greek, word is, who, the Greek word is huios. Um, I don't know if it means slave. It usually means someone, a, a, very, a very dignified, righteous man who was uh, with a special mission from God. Uh, I, I'm not I'm sure if it's the equivalent in, of, of slave that I'm aware of. Sorry. Are we going to talk a little bit about uh, Paul? Yes. I just want to establish some, some ground here before we move on to, yes, uh, uh, directly I'll be dealing with that. So you want the gentleman's asking if you want to deal with Paul, absolutely, so in a minute. Within these uh, four different, you mentioned people, but the, the office of the Gospels, we have Paul, Peter, John, and Paul. Yes. Um, so what is the role of the Okay, we'll, we'll deal with Paul just in a couple of minutes. So uh, that was the question the brother was asking about uh, when we're going to talk about Paul, because he was an eyewitness of Jesus as well. So the claim is made. That, that is true. That is the claim. And we'll deal with that in a second. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry, I'm a lot further to go into it. I just wanted to throw that, uh, you know, because I heard about the, 
uh, Gospel of St. Barnabas. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I wasn't, but I will now you mention it. Yeah. Uh, the, I, I, just 30 seconds, because this is a, uh, so the brother was asking about the Gospel of Barnabas. Um, fortunately, it's becoming less of an issue these days, but uh, according to all scholars, I've never come across a scholar historian in the world that says anything else. The Gospel of Barnabas is a Renaissance forgery. We're going to be touching on Renaissance in the next session. It's not. It's certainly not by the Barnabas, who might have been a companion of Paul. It's, for, it's, it's a fake. And the, it's full of anachronisms. So it, it says things which you know, wouldn't have been known about in the first century. Uh, um, so unfortunately, it, it's, uh, it's very juicy. It's very interesting. But uh, if you want to, if, if we believe in reliable Hadith, if we want Isnads to be good, then this thing has no Isnads and it's a fake. I wish it wasn't so, but that's the bad news, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm just being very simple. Yes, sir. So when you speak about the Gospel of Matthew yeah. being dishonest in relation to the Gospel of Mark... John Barton said that, yeah, not yeah. me. Yeah. What sort of categories of evidence, or what types of evidence are these scholars on relying upon to make these claims, to make these statements about dishonesty? I know that's a bit of a loaded question. Yeah, so the, 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 uh, the brother's asking, you know, what kind of criteria, how do they make this judgment that Matthew is being uh, dishonest? I mean, firstly, I'd say to, do watch the interview on blogging theology with Professor John Barton. Um, just just uh, I'll put his word, B-A-R-T-O-N is his name, uh, on, on the YouTube site, and you can watch the interview. And I think there's a time, time slots as well. And he, he's simply reflecting a common view, which is, that Matthew is being, uh, I mean, I can't speak for him, and it's his word, but he's, he's playing fast and loose with the sayings of Jesus, and he's happy to change them, not John Barton, I mean Matthew, um, to suit his own views. So from a, from a kind of a scholarly point of view, that's dishonest. You, you can't change your sources like that if you don't agree with them. You know, it's not how it works. So I think, that, I think that's where he's coming from. And I was quite shocked when he used that word because I wasn't expecting such a judgmental word. Um, but it was quite refreshing as well, because this is just plain speaking. Let's move away from euphemisms like secondary material, and let's call a spade a spade. So I was quite pleased that he did that. Was there anything? Um, yes, sir. Oh, uh, no. As to um, Dr. Mark's um, question about the Barnabas, um, what's similar with um, the Gospel of Thomas, Judas, and Mary, etc., if there's any others, etc.? Yeah, th these are, um, I, I wasn't going to cover them today because I simply don't have the time. And I, I'm slightly concerned that we're going to run, I haven't even touched Paul yet in the early church. So uh, these are very good questions. Maybe we can talk about it afterwards. I don't, the danger is I get, we, we end up going down a different track. Although there's a very, very good question about the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Judas, and his other Gospels. So, yes, sir. By the way you presented it, it seems pretty straightforward that, you know, Jesus is not God and um, even, even the arguments so what is usually your response when you present what's, what's the counterpart yeah that's a very, a very good point um, often Christians go instinctively to the fourth gospel the gospel of John so when Jesus says I am the way the truth and the life or, uh, or, or statements that seem to suggest that Jesus is called God so Thomas for example in uh, John 20 28 addresses Jesus as my Lord and my God directly but th 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 these are questions of interpretation it's not at all clear that John means what Christians, or Thomas means what Christians believe. But I think the earlier you go back in history to the earlier tradition, you get a much less and less and less divine Jesus. And so if you rewind, rewind the clock going forward, you can see a trajectory from low to high. Christo it's called Christology. This is the uh, study of the, the status and nature of Jesus. You get this definite kind of rocketing up, you know, um, as you go through. It's interesting that all the Quran says about this, of course, to the Christians. Do not go to excess. Jesus was just a messenger of God. And the Quran really laser-like theology, zoom, goes in and say, nope, don't do that, wrong. Um, and that's one of the, 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 the extraordinary things about the Quran, that it really gets to the issues on this. Uh, and on many other subjects as well. Um, I, I better press on because I, I don't want to run out of time. Sorry about this. Um, I want to um, look at uh, Paul now and James um, and address um, some of the points that were made. Let me just see what's... Uh... Oh yeah, this is a picture of the Bible, by the way, in case you've never seen one before. It's the Holy Bible, the King James Version. This is the most popular English translation in the world. Uh, James didn't actually do it himself. He employed a bunch of scholars at Hampton Court in London to do it. 
Uh, but this is the basis of, of virtually all modern translations until the 20th century. Um, so incredibly popular, especially in the United States. Some Christians think this is the perfect translation. This is the real word of God. But it ain't because Jesus didn't speak King James English. He spoke Aramaic. I'm sorry. In fact, no one in the Bible spoke English. <laughs> it's just unfortunate. Anyway, that's a rather nice copy of the Bible. Um, I just quickly mentioned this if you want some jargon. Um, this is purely academic. So um, we have the Synoptic Gospels. The earliest gospel, as I say, is Mark. The, there's another source called Q. Q is the word, is short for quell. Quell is a German word meaning source. And scholars now say that the later gospels of Matthew and Luke used Mark, the earlier gospel, and another source, Q, in, in compiling their own gospels. So here we have Luke. Um, we had that kind of, I don't know, is that red color? So he, he takes on board Mark, gobbles it up and changes it sometimes. He's got, he's, Luke is, consists of Mark, Q and his own unique source material. That kind of green is the material unique to Luke and not found anywhere else. Like the parable of the Good Samaritan or the, the prodigal son. This is only found in Luke and that's unique material for him. And in Matthew's gospel, Matthew gobbles up Matthew, uh, Mark, as we know. He changes it, embellishes it, corrects Mark. This, by the way, means that Matthew did not regard Mark as the word of God. Because if he did, he wouldn't have altered it, would he? <laughs> So he changed uh, and corrected Mark. He, ha he also used gobbled up Q, a source also shared by Luke. And Matthew has his own unique material. The Sermon on the Mount, for example, a lot of it is unique to, not all of it, a lot of it is unique to Matthew. And the other stories are unique to Matthew. So this is called the two source hypothesis. And notice John is nowhere to be seen. That's a separate thing entirely because it's so different from Matthew, Mark and Luke. Um, Oh, that's my last slide. So I'll leave that up for the moment. Um, you don't have to learn this. I'm just giving you a flavor of the academic understanding of the, the Gospels. Back to Paul. Paul, who was Paul? Embarrassing, actually, I wasn't gonna say this. In Greek, the word Paul means small. I don't know why, I mean, why is that a name? My name's Paul. Very embarrassing. No, it was Saul is a Hebrew word, named after King Saul, the first king of Israel. Yeah, I'm just saying in English. Um, so yes, if you were addressing Paul as a Hebrew, you would call him Saul. Um, but anyway, that's beside the point. So who was Paul? Um, he was a, a Hellenistic, remember Hellenism? He was a Hellenistic Jew born in Tarsus in this country. Well, Turkey didn't exist then, of course. Um, but in Tarsus, which is... I think somewhere on the coast of Turkey today. Um, important things to know about Paul. He never met Jesus. He really didn't. He never met him. But he did claim to have met him on the road to Damascus, where according to Acts, this is a book in the Bible, Paul says he had a vision of Jesus. A vision of Jesus. And the story of Jesus' appearance to Paul is told in three different versions in, the, in the Acts. Acts is the Luke's history of the early church in the Bible. And in one of the versions of the story, they differ actually, the people with Paul, when he saw Jesus, oh, I'm seeing Jesus, the people with him saw nothing at all. They saw nothing. So Paul, I don't have a problem with believing Paul had a vision. Lots of people have visions. Visions of Mary, visions of Buddha, visions of their dead mother-in-law, I don't know, they have visions. This is normal in human experience. So Paul had a vision, but he never met the fleshly, the earthly, the historical Jesus of Nazareth at all. Um, it was several years later, probably, that he had his, his conversion experience. And uh, because we don't have much time, I'm just gonna make a, um, a simple, but perhaps controversial point, which I think goes to the heart of the matter. I'm not being controversial for the sake of it, but I think it goes to the, the essence of the issue. If you look at the earliest Jesus evidence we have, like in Mark or Q, remember these Mark and Q are used by the later gospel writers when they wrote their own gospels. Back in time, we have Q and Mark. These are our very earliest historical sources um, in, in the gospels. If you look in the earliest gospels and, and Q, Jesus is not really preaching about himself. He doesn't go around saying, I am God. I am a second, per I am the savior. I am the light of the world. I am divine, I am the son of God. He doesn't say any of this. What does he do? I mean, it's there in Mark chapter one, you can look it up. He preaches God and his kingdom, the good news of God. In fact, that's there in Mark chapter one, the very first chapter of the earliest gospel. Um, and when people come to him and say, good teacher, what must I do to be saved? He says, obey the commandments. Okay, so we, we covered that briefly. But what does Paul say? Well, 
I'll give you an example. In um, Acts, where's my Bible gone? Um, Acts, again, is, is the alleged history. I say alleged because historians don't regard it as very reliable. But here we have a story of Paul and what his preaching is about. So in Acts chapter 16, um, someone asks him, what must I do? Ask Paul, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, quote, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. So to be saved for Paul, you've got to believe in Jesus. And that sounds evangelical. That's the sort of thing you'll hear a fundamentalist Bible preacher in the United States preaching to his church. Believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. You'll be born again and you'll go to paradise. You'll go to heaven. Hang on. Did Jesus just preach that? Did, did, did Jesus preach that? I, I, I don't think he did. There's no evidence that Jesus preached any of that. He didn't preach that. So what we have here, and this is my key point, I guess, my takeaway point, is that we, have the, we, have, we had originally the gospel of Jesus, the Injil, as the Quran calls it, of Jesus. This is the message that Jesus was tasked to proclaim. And it's interesting, the Quran and the earliest evidence agree on this. Paul comes along and preaches a gospel about Jesus. This is the fundamental difference. This is what Christianity becomes. The message, the gospel of Jesus, becomes the gospel about Jesus. And this is what Paul preaches. He doesn't preach Jesus' message. He preaches Jesus. And not just Jesus as the historical Jesus, but a Jesus who died on the cross and rose again for the sins of the world. And that's the way you'll say, by believing in that, you are justified, as Paul says in Romans. You are made right with God. Do you see, it's a huge difference, isn't it? Is that the same religion? I mean, Bart Ehrman, Professor Bart Ehrman, in one of his books, says, did the tradition miscarry? That's literally a quote. Did the tradition miscarry? In other words, did it go off, off, completely off beam? The answer is yes, because the gospel of Jesus and the gospel of Paul are completely different. And Christianity is the gospel of Paul. It's believing in Jesus. It's not what Jesus preached. And this is the fundamental, for me, this is the fundamental fact of the issue. And what does the Quran do? It preaches the Injil of Jesus and calls people back to the original message and rejects the Christian dogmas of the Trinity and, the, and so on. So that's very interesting that the Quran actually calls back to the original facts about Jesus. Um, Back to Paul. So um, again, I'm just going to um, very simplistically mention another figure who's really key to unlocking the secret. If you want to talk about unlocking secrets, the guy's name is James. James. Who is James? James actually, historically, believe it or not, was the brother of Jesus. Jesus had brothers and sisters. And James is mentioned in our earlier sources as the brother of Jesus, believe it or not. So what happened to him? Was he a disciple? Mm, perhaps not early on, but we know that later, after Jesus left the scene, ascended into heaven, who became head of the church? Well, of course, Peter did, of course. He was the first pope. Two billion Catholics, well, not two billion. Anyway, a lot of Catholics will tell you that. <laughs> Forget their numbers these days. But actually, if you look at the historical record, if you look in Acts, James became the head of the church in Jerusalem. It says that in Acts. It says in other sources, Eusebius, the early church historian in the third century, second and third century, he actually mentions that the first one to be appointed or elected by the disciples of Jesus himself was James, the brother of Jesus. Why? Why? Well, because, well, this is a good question. It's like a dynasty or dynasty, as Americans call it. Um, it's almost, to be controversial, a bit like a sheer kind of imminate. You have the family of Jesus taking control. So you have Jesus, then you have his brother, and after that, we know who came after. It was a cousin of Jesus. I'm not making this stuff up. It's there in the historical record. There was a succession of Jesus's family members, like in, in the Shia understanding. I'm not saying it's the same. I'm trying to give you a, a parallel. Um, and this died out in the second century, by the way. But there was a Jewish succession line from within the family of Jesus who ruled the church, centered in Jerusalem. The Gentile church, this is the non-Jewish church, centered on Paul's teaching, had a different trajectory. And we see that focused in Rome, in Rome, where Paul died. And there you do have the idea of apostolic succession through Gentile bishops, allegedly starting from Paul, uh, Peter, I mean, 
but that's disputed very much so by historians. But you clearly have a Gentile Christianity emerging. And James's faith was, what was James's, what religion did James follow, do you think? Jew. It, was, it was a Jew. He followed Judaism. <laughs> he was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. He followed the same religion of his brother. Did James see his brother as God? No. Did he see him as a Messiah? Probably. Prophet? Probably. Um, but not as God. No, no, no Jew saw Messiah as God. He was not expected to be divine. He was expected to be a king like David, anointed to liberate the Jews from their enemies, the Romans in this case. So a another really important takeaway point I want to stress here is that we're talking about Christianities. There is no thing called Christianity. I mean, there's a thing called Islam. But Islam is a different kind of faith where it's been preserved, intact, on a purely human level, if you like, right from the Quran, the manuscripts, the authentic hadith, right up to today. We know exactly how the Prophet upon him be peace prayed because we have this massively inherited tradition. You know, you know all this. But Christianity is not like that. We have multiple Christianities, and that's the word I'm kind of stressing here. We have the Christianity of James, because James was a Christian. You know, he believed his, his brother was the Messiah. That makes him a Christian. Paul was a Christian, but their views were very different. And, and there was a, a many, many scholars, well, most scholars have noted a, a schism, a split right at the beginning of the Jesus movement between those who followed Paul and said, believe in Jesus, this dying and rising savior figure. And those who followed James, the Jewish Christians, centered in Jerusalem, who obeyed the law, who did not think their brother was, uh, Jesus was God. They saw him as a prophet, a human being. And if you quick, quick look at the, uh, the handout I've given you, I make reference to, I think, oh yeah, the Ebionites. It's the fourth one down. I just want to mention them very briefly. A group of second century Christians who maintained their Jewish identity and insisted that followers of Jesus need to keep the Jewish law. And the Ebionites were the direct successors of James in Jerusalem. Remember, James was Jesus' brother. He was appointed or elected by the apostles themselves, according to our earlier sources in Eusebius and other places, Josephus, the Jewish historian. And the Ebionites, I mean, this is my opinion, the Ebionites were very Islamic in terms of their understanding of Jesus, the law, God, Tawheed, very Islamic. And there is the sense that, again, this is my opinion, that the more you put Jesus back into his Jewish context, his history, his culture, his faith, the more you Islamicize Jesus. Because in many, many ways, Islam and Judaism are almost twins. The very, now, I'm not talking about political events since 1940. I forget about that. I'm talking about the religion here. The very Islam, you know, their understanding of the law, understanding of God, the understanding of the Messiah. Very, very similar. Islam and Judaism are very similar. So the more, in my view, this is my personal view, take it or leave it, the more you put Jesus back in his historical context and you put the, his family and the followers, the more you're looking at a very Islamic kind of understanding of Jesus. Why is that matter? Well, the irony is that later Christians, of course, turn Jesus into a, a, a saviour God. And there's a certain family, if you look at the ancient near the Greco-Roman world, there are lots of Gentile cults, pagan cults, and many of them had a family resemblance, because it was a Greco-Roman world, the Hellenistic world. And they had certain features which are actually quite common to the Gentile Christianity that came out of Paul. So that you, that there would be a common meal in honor of the God. This is not Christianity, this is the, the pagan cults. The idea of a dying and rising God or demigod is a common theme in ancient pagan religious practice and mythology. There are many family similarities between what developed with Paul and the pagan world. Conversely, if you can compare um, James and Jesus' religion, we're looking at something that is very similar to Islam, a strict monotheism, belief in the prophets that God sent, and, and so on. We, we know that is. Um, I haven't got much time. Let me just move on quickly to... Um, yeah, I'm just going to mention the Council of Nicaea. This is jumping about a bit. We don't have much time. Um, <laughs> this is not a photograph. This is... Uh, um, <coughs> The Council of Nicaea, uh, and there, there are certain misconceptions and myths about the Council of Nicaea, I just wanted to hit on the head if I have the opportunity to do so. The Council of Nicaea matters because this took place in Turkey, well, Nicaea, 
Nicaea is, is kind of virtually extinct now. There's a few ru ruins left, but it's actually in this country, geographically. Um, it was called by the Emperor Constantine, a Roman emperor, uh, in 325 AD. And he called the council, because he was obviously the emperor of the Roman Empire. And he wanted to settle a dispute that was splitting apart the empire. The, 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 Christian, the Christians were arguing about who was Jesus. And he really wanted to settle this matter. So he called all the bishops of the world together uh, in Turkey. It was anachronistic, of course. Turkey didn't exist. But anyway, in Nicaea, uh, to decide the issue. And they voted, as you do. They voted um, by majority vote that Jesus was God. As you do, you have a vote. That's how decisions are made. That's how, that's how you do theology. No, I, I don't mean to mock, but I mean they, seriously, they did have a vote, and I'm not making this up. And the people who voted against it, they were sent into exile by Constantine. So there was a heavy pressure to kind of go the right way, because they knew if they didn't, they'd be exiled. That means leaving your family, your home, your everything. And um, a number of them were exiled for giving the wrong answer to the question. Um, the technicality was, is Jesus, uh, because there was Athanasius and there was Arius, Athanasius defending what we would call Christianity, Arius doubted or said that Jesus wasn't Yahweh. Uh, and uh, the council, and uh, here it is in all its splendor, um, decided that Jesus was homoousion, that means of the same substance of the Father. Since the Son was the same substance as the Father. As the Father is God, the Son is God. And the technical Greek word is homoousion. Homo meaning the same. Ousia uh, is the Greek word for being. So Jesus was the same being. In Latin, it's called consubstantial, of the same substance. This, by the way, so, so what, what, what are the myths about this? There are several myths I just want to knock on the head. This council was not talking about the Trinity. The Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God, three equal persons. They didn't discuss the Trinity. They discussed who was, the, who was Jesus, who was the Son. But they did proclaim him to be God. Secondly, um, I'm going to mention the Da Vinci Code. I'm thinking, why am I mentioning that? Uh, um, the Da Vinci Code, you might or might, I don't know, if you know, Dan Brown's novel and turn into a film with, um, who was the guy who played? Thank you. Thank you, Tom Hanks. Um, uh, the film is based on his 2003 best, bestseller, 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 The Da Vinci Code. Now, this planted the idea in many people's minds in the West who saw the film or what, read the book, um, that somehow uh, Constantine or Nicaea established the Bible, established which books went in the Bible, decided which gospels went. It's a complete myth. No evidence whatsoever. This is a made-up story. The council was concerned with who was Jesus. Was he, was he co-equal with God or was he created being, and nothing to do with the canon of scripture, the Bible. And that's a myth that, unfortunately, people, because of Dan Brown, bless him, anyway, um, um, we've got to deal with that issue. Um, that's wrong. I say it's not to do with the Trinity, it's to do with who Jesus was. The first creed, I think, that explicitly teaches the Trinity, um, the Trinity of persons, is the Athanasian Creed. And that was in the sixth century, <laughs> a bit later. And there you had the idea of the, explicitly says, you must believe that the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. But they're not three gods, there's one God. That's what it says. My mass is terrible, by the way. Anyway, I tend to think if, if, if one, if the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit, that makes three. But, but it, having stated that, and then it denies what it's just stated by saying, no, there's only one God. Anyway, that's... Um, that's the Athanasian uh, creed, and they're all equal, of course. So the Nicaea didn't do that. That, that was a, a later uh, creed. Um, right, so I'm going to... Um, I, I've skipped over so much, and there's so much we could say, and I just want to give you some, as I say, some summary points. This is my opinion. Please investigate it for yourself. I've got some recommended reading there. This fundamental shift, in my view, is from the Gospel of Jesus, the Injil preached by the Messiah, the prophet of God, to a later Injil, where Jesus himself is the content of the message. He is the subject of the gospel. But Jesus didn't go around preaching himself. How do we know the earliest evidence is he didn't do that? So we have a religion that really has fundamentally changed, actually. And this is, if you can speak on a purely human level, this is the genius of Islam, that it actually correctly diagnoses perhaps the problem, and suggests we need to go back to, to be faithful to Jesus. So you could say, in fact I do say, if you want to be a faithful follower of Jesus today, 
you've got to be a Muslim because then you're going to follow the religion of Jesus. Um, now, I didn't notice I didn't say Judaism. Why not? Judaism rejects Jesus. It rejects Jesus completely. And Muslims don't reject Jesus. So if you want to follow Jesus, in fact, if you want to follow Moses, if you want to follow Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon them all, there's only one religion in the world that will do that, and that is Islam. You get all three. Judaism, you only get one. Christianity, you get two. It's a great bargain. You get three in Islam, um, if I can put it that way. Um, so I, I'll end it there, because I'm conscious there, there are so many loose ends there. But if you have any questions or comments, even, please do. Um, just something that struck me with the whole, you know, going from uh, when you mentioned about John and, and the change in the Bible. Yeah. I was just thinking about the uh, that's a contentious topic, but uh, some of the history mentioned of formation of Shiism is that there was um, a boy, the Saba, who became Muslim and then preached about uh, uh, about Ali, what he used to oh, yeah. think John the Baptist. Yes. There was a God that was that yeah. started there and then that just, you know, thought that excuse me. Yes, I mean, the brother is saying that there are some, um, uh, some followers of Ali who uh, Ali disowned completely, who saw Ali as divine in some way, incarnation of it. And, and yeah, there is a, the idea of dynasty, the idea of, of, of the faith centered around a family, I think is there in early Christianity, which, with Jesus and his brother and his mother and his cousin. I think it's Simeon. Um, it's, it's there in Josephus, it's there in Eusebius. That they kind of chronicle, they say, well, who came after James? You got other family members. And in the, in the early second century, the emperor uh, apparently took an interest and he actually sent people to quiz this uh, family member of Jesus because he was concerned of, you know, is this, a, is, is this person subversive? Are they a threat to the Roman order? Uh, and he basically said he wasn't. So the, the family continued to exist even in the second century, Jesus' own family. And they were seen by many J Jewish Christians as. You know, the, 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 in a sheer way, you know, the, the family itself, from the prophet to his, his sons and cousins and so on, compared to Paul, who completely rejects that. It's just purely faith in Jesus' death and resurrection will get you saved. It's a very different message. Um, sorry, I don't know who was next, yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering, so if we look to like the earliest sources, mm. um, what exactly is Jesus teaching in relation to Jews? Like what, what is, like, does he have his own Sharia, even if he's not claiming to be, you know, the son of God? Yeah, the, 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 the view now, the consensus view, I think, <coughs> most historians is, uh, and this is quite shocking if you're a Christian, is that Jesus was a Torah-observant Jew. Okay? He's a Torah-observant Jew. He followed the law. Now, hang on, I thought Jesus abolished the law. No, well, Paul said that. Yeah. Paul says in Ephesians uh, 2.15 that Jesus abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances. But if you look at the earliest historical evidence, say in Matthew even, Jesus tells people to obey the law. In Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 23, um, he says, obey the law, don't abandon it. So he, uh, Christians, t so take the, the, the issue of uh, eating pork. Would Jesus have eaten pork? Absolutely not. Why? Because he was a Jew. <laughs> it says you don't eat it. But Paul said you could eat pork because he said all foods are clean. I mean, these are the fundamental differences between the two religions. So who, who has greater claim on us as God-given truth, Paul or Jesus? It's a no-brainer if you're a Muslim. And I guess I was wondering, is there a feeling that, like, at the time, is Jesus accusing the Jews of his time of losing that law or, like, in relation to the Jews of his time? Like, I, what is the need? Yeah, no, I think the emphasis, uh, if, if, if we can work this out, the emphasis uh, for Jesus then would not be on mere external obedience to the law, but uh, uh, he radically interiorizes the truth of the law. So in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, uh, you know, uh, you've heard that it was says, you know, d d don't kill, don't murder. I say to you, says Jesus, you know, d don't have hate in your heart. Oh, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. We should just say that in the law. But Jesus says, but don't even lust in your heart. You know, he, he takes it a step further. He makes it even more difficult to obey in a way. Uh, you know, he, he takes the demands on the, the believer much higher. So he's not just an external legalist, because he, he's very much against that. Uh, he believes in a God of love and compassion and mercy, Rachma, that comes across very clearly in the earliest sources. Um, and there's an interesting nuance here, which again, come back to the Quran. The Quran suggests, I think, that, uh, that 
in the ministry of Jesus, some of the, the laws were relaxed or changed, or abolished, rather. And that's exactly what we find in our earliest sources in the, in the Gospels. Um, and it's something that Dr. Shabar Ali has mentioned in, in his brilliant book on this, actually. Um, it's extraordinary when you, when you compare the earliest evidence to what the Quran says, there's some stunning parallels that make it virtually impossible that a seventh century Arab could have known these things. You'd have to be you know, a modern scholar with all the, the evidence and knowledge of Aramaic and Jewish culture. It just didn't exist in Arabia. So, sorry. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for uh, your presentation. I'm just wondering um, what uh, can Muslims learn from the, the Christians so that we don't end up losing uh, hearts and minds of people as Christians have uh, quite obviously. Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. I mean, in my own conversations with Christians, I like to stress that the, the, the actual message that Jesus went around preaching is actually completely compatible with Islam. And that's relatively easy to show. If, for example, in Luke's Gospel, um, there are lots of parables, stories about Jesus, uh, sorry, parables about God, about salvation, and half of them could be Hadith. I mean, they could, I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, you really, wow, you know, it's very Islamic. And there's no reference there to Jesus dying for your sins. Um, I mean, I can give you one of my favorite examples. I think it's Luke chapter 18. Uh, it's a story of two people who go up to the temple to pray. This is Jesus teaching this. It's only found in Luke. Uh, one is a tax collector and one's a Pharisee. Now, tax collectors are bad people because they collect taxes on behalf of the Romans. The Pharisee is a good guy because he's pious and he prays and so on. So these two guys go up to the temple in Jerusalem, which was destroyed in AD 70, to pray. And um, the, fa the, the tax collector, the bad guy, says, um, uh, you know, God, God have mercy on me, a sinner. You know, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't even look up to heaven, according to the parable, uh, because he's so conscious of his sin. But the Pharisee, the holy man, says, thank God I'm not like this tax collector. I fast, I mean, to put it in Muslim language, I, I pay zakat, I fast during Ramadan, I pray five times a day. Thank God I'm not like this tax collector who was so humbled he wouldn't even look up to God. And Jesus said that the tax collector went home justified before God because, and this is the, the punchline I guess, whoever humbles themselves will be exalted. Whoever exalts themselves will be humbled. Wow, I mean, that's just pure Islamic spirituality. So you know, if, if you say, I'm proud because I do this, this, well, that's not what God wants. He, he wants his servants to be, walk humbly with him. So this, I, I mean, the, the idea of being justified, by the way, in that passage, how do we get right with God? And God is saying, we get right with God by humbling ourselves before our creator. And if that's not Islam, I don't know what is. But that's it. You know, I mean, he's not saying, well, believe in my death on the cross and my atoning sacrifice and the shedding of my blood. And on the third day, I rose again for your sins. Believe in that and you'll be right before God. It's not, it doesn't say that anywhere in the early evidence. But he says that in Luke and in many other passages and parables. Um, so basically, I, because I, I'm fairly familiar with the New Testament, I use all these stories from the Gospels and I play them back to Christians and then point out the correlation, the connection, the similarity, often the identity of that and Islamic teaching in the Hadith and the Quran. And that's all I do. You know, your Jesus is actually better, as an, as, is not historical. The real Jesus is the Muslim Jesus, I would argue. And I can argue that on historical grounds, let alone believing in the Quran. Um, but that's just me. Um, sorry. Yeah. With that just said, Dr. Paul, um, just when I, um, sorry, I bear with me. Um, you were talking about the Bible, the Gospels, etc., and the teachings of Jesus. How, and what I'm saying is also, I think you're correct in saying that um, it's been changed, etc. But when giving Dawah, how do we relate to say that that is the actual message of Jesus? So, in, like, for example, the resurrection and how, how do we, when we're given a doubt or point using the Bible, how can we say? Well, I focus on the message of Jesus because, like, say, Luke's Gospel, uh, less so and much less so in Mark, but in Matthew as well, you get lots of tracks of teaching of Jesus, alleged teaching of Jesus. 
and uh, you know, the vast majority of it is very Islamic, uh, and, and I, I just reference that. And it points to how people are saved, how we're made right by God. These are not trivial things. These are fundamental matters of spirituality and theology. And I say this parallels Islam amazingly. Now, bits in the Gospels don't parallel that, of course. So in, in uh, the end of Matthew uh, and in John, there's the talk of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, but that's a slightly different subject. The Quran has something quite nuanced on that. You know, it appeared to them, the Jews, that he was crucified, Jesus was crucified. But in fact, he wasn't. But the appearance was given. And if you look at the earliest gospel, the gospel of Mark, there is no resurrection appearance in Mark. And the disciples, when the crucifixion, as described by Mark, is happening, all of the disciples run away. So they're not there. And the women, it says, saw the crucifixion at a distance. That's literally what the N NRSV says in, in English. So they saw what they thought, the disciples, just a few women, at a distance, what they thought was Jesus being crucified. And that kind of, you can see the Quran is saying, well, the appearance was given that he was, but in fact he wasn't. And I think, I think the Quran is saying that God rescued Jesus by some kind of miracle. Um, and indeed in Gethsemane, the day before, Jesus, according to the Gospels anyway, Jesus begs God to deliver him from this ordeal. And I think I would argue that God answered Jesus' prayer and said, yes, I will rescue you from the enemies of God, from the enemies of Jesus. Um, and that's kind of, but it, the thing is the Gospels are not eyewitness testimony. That's the consensus of historians. They're second generation. They're embellished. Occasionally they make up stories. Um, and so it, it's very difficult to kind of navigate around the evidence because you're dealing with kind of some fiction and made up stuff as well as some history. That's why historians develop quite sophisticated scholarship to try and laser like go in and find out what's original, historical, and what's secondary or made up. Anyway, sorry. Sister. Hello, Brother Paul. Um, you know the Gospel of Mark, that seems to be the most authentic one. Is there any chain of narration to hmm. go to the... That's a very, very, a very, very good question. Short answer is no. I, the, I mean, the whole thing about Isnad and chain of narration and reliability, unfortunately, doesn't exist. Now, Christians will say it does. What do they say? Well, Matthew was a tax collector. He knew Jesus. He wrote that gospel. You don't need a chain of narration. You've got an eye. The problem is it's not true. It doesn't claim to be by Matthew. Historians don't think it was by Matthew for a whole bunch of reasons. If you take away the first person, if you take away the eyewitness authorship, then you're left with an anonymous second generation text. We don't know who wrote it, where it was written, who the guy was, or anything. So we have to reconstruct from the contents of the gospel itself to try and work out who the author might have been. And we think in Matthew's case, he would have been a Jewish Christian who advocated Torah observance for Christians, that Christians should still obey the law. And this is radically different from what Paul said. Paul said you don't have to obey the law. In fact, you shouldn't obey the law because that's the old dispensation. So you have a fundamental contradiction between what Matthew taught about Jesus' teaching and the law and so on, and what Paul taught. And again, these are not my wacky ideas. This is totally mainstream. This is standard stuff. It's just, oh, the one, the one final issue I wanted to address, I nearly forgot, is Christians generally, and again, it's not just my, this is a well-known observation, don't know anything about this. They've never heard of Giza Vermish. They've never heard of the synoptic problem. They've never heard of Mark and Porosi. They've never heard of James being the head of the church. And they don't know about this. Why don't they know about it? This is a, is a really fundamental issue. And people at Bart Ehrman have addressed this and others. Uh, John Barton, I discussed it with him. You can watch it on Blogging Theology. It's Professor Oxford, we discussed this. And the, the reason w w is probably several fold. Um, Christians you know, who go to church are often intelligent people. They might have a degree in engineering. They might have a degree in psychology. They might have responsible jobs. But when it comes to the faith, their own Christian faith, often, usually, that they're not very well informed. I'm not being rude. I'm just saying they're not. Um, and they're not aware of this scholarship. Why aren't they aware of it? Well, their priests, their ministers, their pastors have been trained in seminaries and universities like at Oxford, where Giza Vermish taught, they know about it. So why didn't they tell their parishioners? Well, okay. <laughs> partly because um, 
many people think, because they don't want to harm the faith of their parishioners. They don't want to tell them, you realize the gospels are not eyewitness testimony. I mean, who wants to be told that? Maybe they're fearful they'll lose their jobs. Maybe, they're, maybe they just know, how, how do you communicate all this stuff in a sermon on a Sunday morning to the congregation? Because this is not great news. You know, it's, you know, the idea that John's gospel is a much later, highly interpreted account that is heavily fictionalized. I mean, who wants to hear that? So th th there is a, a colossal chasm between the, the, the scholarship on the one hand and the lay Christian on the other. And Christians normally know nothing about this, um, which is why I want to share it with you, because it is useful for Dower, <laughs> need I hardly need say. Um, and it's useful to know about these things. And I said, I've got the recommended reading, E.P. Sanders, a uh, book on the historical Jesus, which is a classic text. If you really want to go into this, read E.P. Sanders. Oh, there are many other, but Bart Ehrman's books are very good as well, actually, very readable. So for me, this is a scandal. It's a scandal. It's as if, to give a, uh, an analogy, you know, the ulama knew lots of stuff about the Quran and the Hadith, and they're not telling us about it. But, but, but by the way, they are, there's no such thing. That's just that's made up. There, there are no secrets. But in Christianity, there are. And, um, and part of the reaction to biblical scholarship, particularly in the United States, has been a thing called fundamentalism, fundamentalist Christianity. And this is kind of a, a drawing in the trenches and saying, we don't know about these scholars. We're going to say the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Of course, Jesus is God. He was born of a virgin. Trinity is true, the Bible's perfect. We don't want any, any of this stuff. It's called fundamentalism. It's a reaction against the threat of this. So uh, that's a kind of a cultural reaction you see in the media, and you, particularly in the United States and the southern states. Um, and it's a real problem. And many, many missionaries you'll come across are fundamentalist Christians. Uh, and, and that's, in fact, normally they are fundamentalist Christians, I should say. And some of them, these are not fools. Many of these people are very bright, nice people. But they, they've dealt with this problem uh, by putting up the shields and putting in this armor plating, they think, to protect them from this. Unfortunately, it's not very attractive and it's not very honest. Um, yeah, so, uh, so there, there is, uh, most Christians have no idea, they, they perhaps don't want to know, and their own leaders don't tell them. Why they don't tell them is the question. And I think there are multiple reasons to do with job security, not knowing how to do it, not wanting to upset people, not wanting to undermine people's faith, and all that. But it's very patronizing, very patronizing. Well, we're not, I'm not gonna tell you the truth, it might upset you. Okay, well, I wanna know the truth, please. Even if it's painful, it's better to know the truth. Um, but I think some people are scared to share the truth. And this has been going on for two centuries now. This is not like last week, this is like old news. I mean, this was published in 1973, Jesus the Jew. I mean, that's like, 50 years ago or something, 40 years ago. Anyway, yes, we, I'll end it now uh, because I've, yeah. Um, but thank you very much for your uh, time. And um, I'm sorry it's been so on the surface. There's so much more one could say, but there's a, a reading list to follow it up. Thank you very much.